All right, well, good morning, Lakeside. It is once again a privilege to be with you through our live stream again today as we press on into our study of Philippians, as we learn to pursue Christ together. And today's passage uh, dives into pursuing Christ confidently and to be single-mindedly fixated on Christ is how to pursue Christ confidently. You know, for the most part, in order to accomplish, the, in, in, to accomplish a to-do list each and every day, uh, one has to do one thing at a time. Every now and then, I love it when a, my to-do list has a couple things on there, and I can look at it and say, oh, one action will take care of both those things. That would be so great. But most of the time, it's to accomplish one thing. To accomplish my to-do list, I have to do it one thing at a time. One writer says, consider the postage stamp. Its usefulness consists in the ability to stick to one thing till it gets there. And that's what we're gonna dive into in this passage today. So we're gonna see that Paul and his usefulness, he saw his usefulness consist in the ability to stick to his savior, Jesus, until he got to the point where he was with Jesus. So let's pray before we dive into this passage today. Father, I am so thankful today for your word. And God, I am so thankful for the study study this week in my life that, that you're using it to help my mind and my heart to be fixated only on Jesus. And Lord, I pray for those who are, maybe are watching today that they don't know Jesus as their Savior. They don't have a personal relationship with you through Jesus. God, I pray that they would hear the, the power in, in the life that you've called us to through your son, Jesus. I, I pray that they would see that this is the only way to truly experience life fully is to focus on Jesus and to have that relationship with God through Jesus. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would come and he would take over this service, that you would uh, use my words, that they would be your words, Lord. God, I am just another beggar showing other beggars where to find bread. So Lord, use this broken vessel. May we go from this place, may we leave from our living rooms today changed and being more like Christ, and being more fixated, and being single-minded and fixated on Christ today. Thank you for your great love and your great mercy to us. We love you back today, and it's in Christ's name I pray, amen. So as we dive into this passage, as Pastor read this passage, it's pursuing Christ confidently is my, is my, uh, my message today to you and to me. And Paul did this in two ways. Paul did this because he had a proper perspective of life, and then he had a proper perspective of death, and we're gonna go through those two things today. First, we see that Paul had a proper perspective of life. If you look at verse 21 again, Philippians 1, 21, it says, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. A proper perspective of life. And within this proper perspective of life, we see two things. We see that Paul went through redeemed suffering in his life. We know as we've been studying Philippians that he's in prison right now. He is is in a suffering area, but he doesn't view it as suffering. He views it as an opportunity for the gospel. And so he sees his suffering as being redeemed for the sake of the gospel by Christ. We learned last week that Paul, as he's in prison, however, since his perspective of life is to live as Christ, he sees his disappointments as Christ's appointments, his appointments. And we see a couple things when it comes to this, to to live as Christ. We see that, that Paul and his redeemed suffering, he understood that there would be absolute deliverance. That there would be an absolute deliverance. Look what he says in verses 18b, 19. In the last part of 18, he says, yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit, Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. That word deliverance 
It covers a broad spectrum. It could mean being released from prison at this time, from his chains. It could mean being chained for a much longer time, forever. Or it could mean that the sentence would come out to be executed. Which if that was the case, as we'll get into later on, that means he would be with Christ. And so there was no doubt in Paul's mind that he would be delivered And not only was he looking forward to absolute deliverance, but then we see in his suffering, he was looking towards absolute magnification. Look at what he says in verse 20. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now as always, Christ will be honored or magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. That word eager expectation there has the idea of stretching out your neck to see what's ahead. Now there's nobody here, and and one of the... I am never gonna get used to not having people in this auditorium. So I cannot wait till we get back together. But one thing's kind of nice is I can use a racing reference and not get flack for it. And so I'm gonna, so I, I love racing. I love going and watching cars go around in circles. I know, laugh at me all you want. But I greatly enjoy it. And the idea of what Paul's saying, my eager expectation is like this. They're battling for the lead as they come around and they're coming around the final corner and I've been at races like this where I'm stretching forth my neck to see the cars come off the last corner and then stretching forth my neck to see the end result. Who crosses that finish line first? And that's the idea here. And, and Paul's not at a race. That doesn't even matter to him. And that doesn't, that doesn't matter in the big scheme of things when we look at Christ. He's thinking about Christ and what God's going to do and how God's going to magnify himself. And so he has this eager expectation to lean in, to stretch out his neck and look and see, what are you going to do, God? How are you going to make much of yourself? I want to see it so badly. And so as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage now as always, Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. One writer says, so how are we to magnify Christ? How are we to magnify him in our body? Is it like a microscope? And he says, no, it's not like a microscope. A microscope takes things that are small and it makes them bigger so we can see more detail. And that is not how we magnify Christ in our body, whether by life or by death. No, we magnify Christ like a telescope, the writer says. A telescope, we know, takes something big and far away like the stars or the planets And it makes it look like what it really is. It brings the the magnitude of that object into a perspective we can understand and we can see with our eyes. And that is how we call out for God to glorify himself, to magnify himself, to, to take a God who is big and huge and one that we can't, fully understand with our minds, but to be able to see him more like he is, like he really, really is. And Paul, that's how he saw his suffering. He saw his suffering as it would be redeemed, that it was useful, that it was something that God was using for his glory, that God was using to deliver Paul and that God was using to magnify himself above all else. The other day I was talking to to Preston and we were discussing things and we were just talking about our suffering and the suffering that we've gone through in our lives. Some of it was of our own doing, some of it was our sin, but some of it was just life and God allowing things to happen in our lives that were hard and difficult. And as we talked through those things, the thing that we said at the end of that conversation was, we would not trade it for anything 
We would not go back and look at the hard times that God allowed into our lives and we would not trade those for anything because he supremely magnified himself to us and magnified himself to the people around us. And he did some deep work in our hearts to make us more like Jesus. And you know there's a promise in Romans 8 that talks about we know all things will work together for the good for those who love God, for those who he called according to his purpose. And then verse 29 goes on, that's for the purpose of conforming us more into the image of Christ. What an awesome promise that is. And because we have, can have a relationship with God through Christ, and when we have that relationship, he takes our suffering and he redeems it. He makes it valuable. And he uses it greatly. And not only did Paul see that he, saw, that, that he saw his redeemed suffering, but he also saw relentless serving. A relentless serving. And this is verses 19 and then 25 through 26. It's powered, you see that it's powered by the Spirit through the prayers of the believers. That's the first thing we see in verse 19. Let me read verse 19. says, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. You know, as I read that and studied this this last couple weeks, I, I was challenged in my own personal life that if I'm to step into this role of preaching God's word that I need, if Paul, Paul needed, Paul saw that it was powered by the Spirit through the prayers of the believers, that I needed people to be praying for me and specifically for me. So I would go and I would talk to them and I would ask my friends, ask people here at church to, and my other friends and, and, and say, would you please pray for me this week as I prepare to preach and pray that I'd be able to focus on what God wants me to learn and focus as I'm preaching on the message that God wants us all to get. And let me tell you, God is answering your prayers right now as I preach. And I want you to understand that, you know, in this time of isolation and social distancing and those things, the one another ministries have been really hard to do, it seems like, but there's one ministry that nothing can take away from us, and that is the one another ministry of prayer. And I wanna challenge you to enter into that ministry of prayer and pray for one another. Find out what's going on in one another's lives and earnestly pray for them. And I would also just remind you that you're, you have a direct impact on the ministry of whoever is in this pulpit on a Sunday morning. You have a great ministry and you're, you're you're directly impacting that ministry of the person who's here teaching. And so I'd ask you to pray for our pastors, pray for us as we seek to glorify God, as we seek to point people to Jesus. So we see that this was, that, that Paul saw his relentless serving as powered by the Spirit through the prayers of the believers. The next thing we see in Relentless Serving is that this was for the progression of the believer's joy and confidence in Christ. And this is verses 25 through 26. Paul says, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. The Greek word order there at the end would say like, it would be said like this, that your confidence of joy may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me. See, one writer says, as Paul lived on fruitfully, their joy and confidence would overflow because of what Christ was doing through Paul. 
which then would result in the Philippian believers' relentless serving, which brings even more glory to Christ. And then it goes on and on and on. You see, Paul saw that if he was going to remain here in this life, in the flesh, that he was going to go through redeemed suffering, but he was also going to go through relentless serving for the impact of the believers, for their progression of their joy and the progression of their confidence in Christ. That is why we serve God. We serve God so that we can see others. And so our joy in God can overflow to others so we can see others' joy grow and others' confidence in Christ grow more and more. Oh, that we would have this proper perspective of life, that to live is Christ. Think of Christ in his life as he lived here on this earth. Relentless serving was what he was all about. He would go throughout his days serving people after people after people, person after person after person. He would serve them selflessly and give himself for them over and over and over again. And many times he would have to run, get away from the crowds and, and first and foremost when he got away from the crowds, he'd spend time with his father. But then he would also need that physical rest because of his relentlessness in serving the people around him. And then think about Jesus and his suffering. Jesus going to that cross, taking the full wrath of God for our sins upon himself, being forsaken by his Father. And what that suffering accomplished is redemption full and free for those of us who put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And I will ask you today, if you have not accepted your, if you've not accepted Christ as your savior, I would just implore you to do that today. His suffering was for your redemption so that you can live as Christ because there's no better way to live. This is the only way to truly live. To live is Christ. And Paul knew that. And so he had that proper perspective of life. For me to live is Christ. We also see that Paul had a proper perspective of death in verse 21. A proper perspective of death. Look at the last part of verse 21 again. Verse 21 says, For to me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. To die is gain. What a perspective he had on death. And the first aspect of this, pers- of this perspective isn't necessarily found in Philippians chapter 1, but it's found in other, others of Paul, Paul's writings. And it's the fact that for the believer... For those of us who have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, our death has already happened. For the believer, your death has already happened. Look at what Paul says back in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ, co-crucified. It is no longer I who live, it's no longer Paul who lives, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God and Jesus who loved me and he gave himself for me. See, Paul saw that he had been crucified with Christ and we need to be the same way. We need to daily consider ourselves crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. Yes, I have an ID, I have a driver's license, and it says Joel Newman and has my picture on there. But the reality for the believer is I no longer live. I am crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. My identification has to be found in Christ. I need to daily consider myself crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. 
And then there's another aspect of this idea that our death has already happened. And that's from Romans chapter 6, verses 5 through 11. Paul writes in Romans 6, 5 through 11, he starts out the chapter 6 and he says, what shall we do? Shall we just keep on sinning so that grace may abound? And Paul says, no, absolutely not. And in verse 5, he goes on, he says, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, we've died. We shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. And then after Paul explains all of that, he says this statement. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Oh, that we would grasp this truth. Oh, that I would, in the morning when I wake up, as I push the off button on the alarm, and I take that first deep breath of the day, and I start thinking about what I have to do, that the first thought, my mind would go firstly to the cross and to see myself crucified with Christ. And it's no longer me living, but Christ is going to live in me today. And I am dead to sin. Oh, I need to daily consider myself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. That word consider is the word reckon. And Wearsby says this, he says, God does not command us to become dead to sin. He does not command us to become dead to sin. God tells us that we are dead to sin and alive to God. And then he commands us to act on it by faith. You see, we have to, by faith, believe what God says about who we are in Christ is true. That we have been crucified with Christ. That we are dead to sin. We need to reckon that in our lives every morning that it's true. And as we do that by faith, then we will live differently. We will live victoriously. You know, maybe some of you today are struggling with some sin. God does not intend you to struggle with that sin. He intends you, he intends that you lay it at the cross. That you confess it, you agree with him that it's sin. And that you ask for forgiveness and he freely gives that forgiveness because of what Christ did on the cross. And then you press on daily reminding yourself and daily considering, reckoning yourself crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who, cry, I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And then you reckon yourself and consider yourself dead to that sin. I would just implore you today to believe what God has said, that God has said we are dead to sin, we're set free from sin, we are alive to God. And believe that is true and act on it today. Act on it today. So that is one part of this proper perspective of death, that to die is gain. And the other part that is spoken about in Philippians chapter one is that physical death for the believer ushers in true, uninhibited living. 
Physical death for the believer ushers in true, uninhibited living. Look at what Paul says in verse 23. He says, I am hard pressed between the two. I am hard pressed to either stay here and relentlessly serve Christ for, for the good of people and for push pointing people to Jesus. I'm hard pressed between that and I'm hard pressed to be between going and being with Christ. And the idea of being hard pressed is going down a walkway and you have walls on either side and you have no other choice but to go straight through between the two and being pressed in by both of them. And he says in verse 23, I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. That word depart, I love this, because you know Paul made tents. He was a tent maker. And that word depart means to pack up the tent. Pack up this this living space that's not permanent, and to move on. It also is a nautical term. It can mean to set sail for home. And Paul knew about this. He would take boats to different places, to different churches, to plant churches. And then he would go back home. And that's the idea, to open up those sails, to set sail for home. I remember this last year, my family and I had the opportunity to go to South Africa. And it was a great two weeks in South Africa and see what God was doing over there and visit some family but I will never forget getting ready to get on that plane to go home and the, anticipa- and the anticipation that was in my kids and in my wife and in me to see home again, to come back home and see our friends here at home and to see our, our pets and, and, and those things. And that's the idea. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter five, in 2 Corinthians chapter five, verses one through nine, we have Paul talk about this. He talks about the tent. He says, for we know that if the tent, that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God. If we accepted Christ as our savior, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. I I can relate to that. We groan. If indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked, for while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. When we accept Christ as our personal Savior, we have the Holy Spirit as our guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, but we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we'd rather be away from this body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. And that is what Paul views death as. He's so enamored by the fact that death is gain because he will be with his savior once and for all that he cannot just plow on in life. He's constantly thinking, oh, I wanna go and see Jesus. I wanna be with Jesus. I wanna be away from this body that groans to see Jesus. And then at the end of verse 23, at the end of verse 23, Paul says, he says, I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, be at home with Christ. To be absent from the body is to be present for the, with the Lord. And he says at the very end that that being with Christ is far better. And I know I'm gonna break English rules here, but this is just to try and get our minds around what this means. It is far 
better. This is the most highest superlative that can be written. It is far better for me to be with Christ, to depart and be with Christ. I have a friend and we were discipling one another and and my friend actually passed out for 12 seconds. In fact, they had a heart monitor on during this time because he knew something was wrong. And he passed out and his heart stopped for 12 seconds. And one thing I remember him saying after that was, I came to and I pulled myself off the floor and my first thought was, oh, I didn't get to see Jesus. Oh, what an attitude to have. What an attitude to have that Paul has here, that physical death for the believer ushers in true, uninhibited living. One writer says, death for the Christian. Death for the Christian, for those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus, is never pictured in the Bible as a gain over the worst of this life. Instead, it is portrayed as an improvement on the best. Death for the Christian is never pictured in the Bible as gain over the worst of this life. Instead, it is portrayed as an improvement on the best. Think of your best moments here on this earth. Those times where you sat back and said, this is the life. This is the life. I wish every day could be like this. When you and I go and we depart to be with Jesus, it'll be better than the best. It will be better than the best. No more struggle with sin. Nothing more vying for our attention to take it off of Christ. To be absent from this body is to be instantaneously present with the Lord. No more effects of the curse of sin. No more getting up and having aches and pains. We will have the ability to see our holy Savior face to face and not die. To be able to see Jesus, holy God, face to face and not die. And then to forever be in his presence as my Lord and as my King. I am thankful for the leaders we have in our country. And I've been praying for them during this time. But oh, how my heart yearns for the day when the Lord of Lords and King of Kings reigns once and for all. I am so thankful that even though our leaders are put in place over us, that God is over them and I have a relationship with him through Jesus, the King of Kings. For me to live is Christ. To die is gain. I want you to think about that phrase as we close. I want you to think about what that says. For me, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Let's take Christ and gain out of that phrase. And our tendency is to put other things in that phrase. And here's an example of that. Here's an example of that. It could be today that for me or for you to live is to be religious. Maybe for you to live is I'm gonna try my best, I'm gonna go and watch multiple ser- church services today so that I can so I can earn my way to heaven, so I can earn my salvation, earn my favor with God by doing religious things and things that are right and things that are good. I'm gonna try my hardest. So maybe for you today to live is to be religious. Then to die, and don't miss this, 
To die then is to face eternal loss in hell. Our enemy Satan is deceiving you today. If for to me to live is to be religious and you're buying into that lie and thinking, yes, I'm good enough, I will be good enough. When I die, God will say, yes, you did good, come to heaven. When the reality is, you're never going to be good enough. I'm never going to be good enough. It's only because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross for my sins that I can have a relationship with God himself, his righteousness, Christ's righteousness on me, and I accept that gift by faith. I accept that gift by crying out to him and saying, Father, Forgive me. Christ is the only way. I cannot earn my way to heaven. I need Christ. For those of us who have believed on on Christ, though, there are things in this world that are vying for that space. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. There's things that are pushing Christ out of that because we make him our main purpose in life. Think of these other ones. For me to live is to accumulate. For me to live is to travel. For me to live is to work. For me to live is to retire well. For me to live is to see my team win. For me to live is to have talented, smart kids. For me to live is to have an amazing marriage and and the feeling of love all the time. For me to live is to be entertained. For me to live is to be popular. For me to live is is to have fun. All those things are not necessarily bad, but when they take the one place and they take our supreme focus in our life and our life becomes those things, for to me to live is those things. To die then is loss. It's loss and everything this world has to offer that we can put in that blank for me to live is whatever. It will always end in loss. But the one thing, the one person that we put into that blank, as Paul did, for to me to live is Christ. And the result is When we die, it's gain, full gain. It is this single-mindedness that has to win out every day that will result in gain and it will make make it possible for us to pursue Christ confidently. And so I will ask you, Is Christ in that blank today? For to me to live is Christ. If there are other things in that blank today, I would just ask you to spend some time in prayer with God and ask him to create in you a new heart, a clean heart, a heart that is fully devoted to living for Christ. And that you would ask him to strip away all those other things and only Christ would remain and that you would be fully fixated on Christ, having the single-mindedness of Paul to live is Christ, to die is gain. Let's pray. Father, you know as we live this life, God, this life that we're still living in the flesh, that we're still struggling with our old nature. Lord, you know that. And so God, I ask for me and ask for Lakeside, Lord, for all of us, Lord, that you would make Christ our one and only focus. Everything else doesn't 
matter. Only Christ. Lord, if in my life, if things creep in my life, Lord, that start to take the place of Christ as my main focus, as what I'm, as what I'm living for, Lord, I pray, God, that you would do whatever it takes to strip it away, to get rid of it, so that I can say what Paul said, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And Lord, I pray for the one who's watching today. And Lord, they are frustrated with their life. It seems like it's just one disappointment after another, Lord. And they don't get the fact that that living victoriously is possible. And that having eternal life is possible. Lord God, I pray that you'd break through those lies and that you would show them that living victoriously, even within disappointments, is possible because of Christ. And that eternal life with you is possible through Christ today. I pray that you'd break their hearts for you. And that you'd see nothing, that they would see that nothing else will satisfy them but you. And that you would do the powerful, mighty work to draw them to yourself and to gloriously save them today. Lord, help us to just give ourselves over to you. Help us to have that single focus as a body of believers to live as Christ, to die as gain. We love you so much today. We're so thankful for what you've made possible. And it's in Christ's name I pray.